Turn with me in your Bibles again to the book of Genesis at chapter number 15. Genesis at chapter 15, verses 1 through verse number 6. In our continuing series of sermons, Walking with God by Faith. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not. Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou shalt be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Verse 6 reads, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You might think I'm in the early stages of Dementia, but follow me, I'm on my way somewhere with this. How many of you can remember, if you are of certain age, Horton hears a who? Horton hears a who? You got to have small children around or Got to be a small child yourself in your mind. Some of y'all too old to be getting with me on this sermon, but for the younger ones of us in here who can remember, Horton hears a who. You will remember that Horton was an elephant who heard something that the other animals could not hear. He heard from the little town of Whoville in a speck of dust and Horton protected that little speck of dust on a clover bloom and he sat there and he guarded it and he protected it and the other animals tied him up because they thought Horton had lost his mind because Horton could hear what no one else could hear. When you belong to God, you can hear things other people can't hear. God will show you some things that other people can't see. They thought Horton had lost his mind, and so they restricted him. And people will think something's wrong with you. Because you believe in, in something that you can't see. You're trusting in something that you don't have your hands on yet. But faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that are not seen. In our text this morning, Abram hears the word of the Lord. And this word from God revolutionized his life. Let's listen in on this, on this private conversation. It's so, it's so private that it's almost impolite for us to listen in to Abraham's conversation with God. But if we listen closely, this conversation will teach us about our own walk with the Lord. Verse 1 deals with a word about Abram's fear. Abram has just returned 
from a great military victory. If you were here on last Sunday, you remember that some kings from the east went to war against the kings from the west, and I could not pronounce any of those names, so you just took for granted that I knew what I was talking about. And during the course of the campaign, uh, Abram made a bitter enemy of the king of Elam, and he felt in danger of attack when God comes to him with the word to comfort him in his fear. And when we are fearful, and every one of us who's honest has at some point been fearful, we need to know the peace that comes from knowing God. Now, now in verse 1, this is the first time fear not appears in the Bible. But thank God it will not be the last time. Fear not uh, appears in the Bible. Dr. Frank Ray, when he was here some years ago preaching, says that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. One fear not for every day of the year. Uh, fear not. Uh, Abram, fear not. Fear not. That's peace that in the midst of your situation, God has everything under control. Uh, peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is calm in the midst of your conflict. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace just means you can sleep in the middle of your trouble. Peace does not mean that you don't have any problems. Peace just means you can come to church in the midst of your problems. Peace does not mean that everything is going well. You just shout in spite of the fact that it's not going well. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well. I wish I had a witness. It is well. It's not always well with my money, but it's well with my soul. It's not always well with my health, but it's well with my soul. It's not always well with my family, but it is well with my soul. That's peace. The scripture says that surpasses, yeah, you got it, all understanding. But not only does he have peace that comes from knowing God, he has protection that comes from knowing God. Uh, the Lord was encamped about him and all that he possessed, all that God provided, all that God had given him, in the midst of that, with all that God had given him, he still gave him perfect protection day and night. Look at verse 1 again. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Psalm number 34 and verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Uh, Psalm 91 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I put my trust. Psalm number 27 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. God is your protection. God is your shield. God is your strength. God is your high tower. He will provide protection 
in the presence of your enemy. Uh, they can see you, but they can't get to you. They want you to fall, but they can't do nothing about you standing. They don't want you to make it, but God is your shield. I wish I had a witness here. You don't have to fear what men can do to you. God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Have I got a witness here? God will put a fence around you. God will put a bulwark around you so that the devil in hell can stop your progress. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Don't be envious against those who work iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like grass and wither like the green herb. Go home and go to bed. Let them plot against you. God will show you where the trap is. I, I wish I had somebody here who, who God showed you some things that folk couldn't figure out how you knew that. They had already devised a scheme to make you fall, but God showed you not only where the trap was, but who said it. I need, I need somebody here who knows that God will make a way out of no way. God will protect you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. Abram is a man who has left home. He's left his family to follow God. But as yet he has not even the slightest hint of all that he's been promised. He's following God on a promise. Somebody ought to help me here. He's following God on a word. It's not in his hands yet. He does not have possession of it. He just has a promise and God reminds him that the child of God with a promise with nothing in his hand does not need to be pitied. He needs to be envied. Don't pity me because I don't have it yet. Envy me because I'm on my way to it. Don't feel sorry for me because I ain't got it yet. Shout with me when I get it. See, the problem with you, the reason why you don't get happy and the reason why church is just a blur for you on Sunday morning is because you don't trust God. I, I say that about preachers. Oh, preaching that's full of a whole lot of fillers and uh, high five three people and, and run around the building and rock them and shake them and shake them and rock them and, and all of that. That's because you don't trust the word to have power. You, you, ought, you ought to stop reading the Bible if you don't believe it. I said you ought to stop coming to church. You ought to throw your Bible in the trash if you're not going to believe what the promises of God says. Because every promise, every promise is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. You may not have it yet, but keep trusting God. Um, God reminds him that he's faithful. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. That's a word about Abram's fear. But in verses 2 through verse number 5, 
there's a word about Abram's future. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing that I don't have a child and all this, this steward is in my house, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me you have given no seed and one born in my house is my heir. And the word of the Lord said to him, this shall not be your heir, but your heir shall come from your bowels. I want you to see something here about faith. Faith is just simple, childlike belief. Simple, childlike belief. Except you have the faith of a little child. If you can't trust God like a little child, trust his parents. Faith is just as simple and childlike as a child putting confidence in his or her parent. When, 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 when Victoria was a small child, two, three years old, sometimes uh, uh, almost a year, I would put her on top of the refrigerator. And Sybil would be screaming and cussing because I had the baby on top of the refrigerator. And, and Victoria would squeal with delight and dive in my arms because it never crossed her mind that I was going to miss her. She just dove in my arms in childlike faith and somehow she knew if he caught me last time chances are he gonna catch me this time that's the kind of faith you ought to have in the living God if he caught you last time you ought to shout on the fact that even though you ain't got to the trouble yet he gonna catch you next time. Uh, hear me. The simplicity of this faith has to do with the sovereignty of God's promise. The simplicity of the promise has to do with the sovereignty of the promise. God's promises speak a word about God's power. Hear me, br brothers and sisters. Before you exercise your faith, his plans are already in motion. Before you get to use your faith, God is already working in your behalf. You have no idea what God is doing. You just have faith that God is going to do it. But by the time you get to it, he's already worked it out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about it later on in the series. But, but Abram was taking Isaac up to, uh, to this mountain to sacrifice him because God told him to take your only son and sacrifice him. And he's on the way up there to bring him to the mountain to be sacrificed. Isaac says, Daddy, I see the wood. I see the fire. But where is the offering? Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And God said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Somebody ought to help me shout here. Now, Abraham is speaking in the abstract because he has no concrete proof that God is going to do any of what he just told Isaac. But faith don't have to have concrete proof. If God did it before, he can do it again. Those of us who read the text, you know how the story ends. When he get to the top of Mount Moriah, Isaac says, I see the wood, I see, I see the fire, where's the sacrifice? God will provide. By the time Abraham gets there, God has 
already provided. You know how? Because when Abraham was on his way up this side of the mountain, the answer was coming up that side of the mountain. I'm trying to tell somebody this morning, just, 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 just do what you're supposed to do. And by the time you do what you're supposed to do, God is going to be there to do what he's supposed to do because he is no shorter than his promises. I don't know how God's going to fix my child. I just believe he will. I don't know how God's going to work this thing out in my life. I just believe he will. I don't know how God is going to heal my body. I just trust God. If he did it before, he can do it again. But now, I want you to get something here. Abraham says, you promise a son. And I got this servant, Eliezer of Damascus. I'm going to have to use him to be my heir. Abraham is about 75 when he's talking like this. God waits until he's 99. At a time when he has no sexual inclination. His strength, his power sexually is gone. Sarah has been barren. God waits until there is no possible way that Abraham could have participated in his own blessing. Because if Abraham would have done it, God wouldn't get the glory. God waited till it was impossible, then he made a way out of no way. And God might be waiting for you to get out of your own way. He can't bless it as long as you're trying to fix it. I wish I had a witness here. He can't provide as long as you are trying to come up with a scheme. He can't bring it to pass as long as you're trying to get a hookup and trying to work it out and trying to figure it out. Get out the way. By the time you exercise your faith, God has already sent the answer. He waits till Abraham is full of years. He waits until Sarah has cobwebs in her womb. And then at 99 years old, and Sarah is 90, God says, now I'm going to give you what you've been asking for. It's not until you say, I am thine, O Lord. I've heard your voice and it told your love to me. I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Consecrate me now to your service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. When Abraham and Sarah were too old to do it on their own, God showed up. But here's what I want you to get. The simplicity and the sovereignty of the problem or the promise of God moves us to the size of God's promise. It's right here in these verses I've read. Abram is looking for an heir. Abram was concerned about a single heir. One son. But God says, come outside. Look up to heaven. And if you can count these stars, that's how many heirs will be added to your promise. Now come here, let me, let me, let me show you something. 
Abraham just wants one thing when God wants to give him everything. Stop praying for just one thing. God wants to give you everything, but you got to expand the size of your faith. I have stopped praying small prayers. Not when I got a big God. I'm asking God for one little measly car. That, that's the least of God's blessings. That's, that's small. God, God can do that. That's nothing for God to do. You're asking God for that little job. I know, Lord, I'm praying. I'm trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. It's, it's hard, it's struggle. I'm going to this little piece of job. Why don't you ask God for a good job? God, a, a, a piece of man is better than no man at all. Why don't you ask God for a real man? I wish I had one or two witnesses here. You asking God for a little small, minuscule, minor stuff. Enlarge your territory. Have I got a witness here? Ask God for big stuff because you're asking God for big things means your faith is big. Brothers and sisters, hear me. Abram is concerned about a single heir when God is getting ready to give him more heirs than he can count. You worried about a single blessing when God wants to give you more blessings than you can count. I suspect that when we get to heaven and, uh, and, and stand before God and thank him for all he's done for us, God is going to take us to a room where there's a large door. And behind that door, God will say, these are all the blessings you could have had, but you never asked for. And listen, God ain't going to give you what you don't ask for. No, stop, stop waiting on big stuff if you're praying for little stuff. If, you're, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how shall you contend with horses? If you can't make it in the land where peace and prosperity abide, what you going to do at the swelling of the Jordan? Moses got to the Red Sea and he said, Lord, what am I going to do? God said, why are you crying to me? Use what you have in your hand. Can I help somebody this morning? Stop crying to God when God has given you everything you need for life and living in his word. You feeling sorry for yourself? Nobody come to see me. Nobody don't even call me from not church. Call yourself. Nobody wants to spend no time with spend time with yourself. Take yourself to the movies. Take yourself to lunch. Have a good time. Get comfortable in your skin. Thank God for a reasonable portion of health and strength. Celebrate what you have. Thank God for what, stop crying about what you don't have. Thank God for what you have left. Stop worrying about who likes you and who does not. If God be for us, who can be against us? Stop complaining about the stuff that's gone wrong in your life. You ought to be blessed and thankful that God let you make it this far. You remember that a story in the, in the New Testament Jesus told about this man who, who hired some workers at 6 o'clock in the morning. And the workload was so heavy that he went and got some more workers at 9. And then they needed some more and he went and got some at 12. 
And the work was still going on, so he got some at three. And he couldn't finish the work, so at the ninth hour, at five o'clock, he went and got some more workers. And when he got time to pay, when, when the day was over, uh, he called the ones who came last to the window to be paid first. And they received the day's wages. And the ones who came at 6 o'clock thought they should have gotten more than the ones who came at 5 o'clock. And they were angry. They said, we borne the burden in the heat of the day. We worked all day long. And you mean to tell me these people who just got here getting the same thing we got? And, 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 and the owner said, you agreed for what I'm paying you. You ought to be thankful that I hired you in the first place. Let me say to somebody who's complaining about what somebody else has that you don't have, you ought to thank God you got something in the first place because God does not owe any of us anything but hell. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. All you deserve is punishment. We sang it this morning. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Abram is worried about a single heir and God wants to give him everything. That's Abraham's fear. That's a word about Abraham's future. But verse number six is where I'm trying to go. It's a word about Abram's faith. Let's look at verse number six. And he believed in the Lord. And the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. What this verse teaches us about Abram's faith should be true about our faith as well. Let's dissect verse number six. Let's autopsy this verse for a better understanding of what kind of faith we ought to leave here with this morning. He believed in God. Oh, I want you to see something. That, that little word in is the most important word in this verse. He does not just believe the word anymore. He believes God. He moves from intellectual acceptance to absolute trust. Because you can conceive of God intellectually, but to believe God takes absolute trust. You can read the word of God and never believe the God of the word. You can intellectually assent but until you have absolute trust, you don't have real faith. He believed God, and God counted it as righteousness. He believed God in spite of the obstacles. He has no son. He's childless. Him and, him and Sarah devised this plan for him to lay with Hagar and they have Ishmael, but that's not God's promise. Worse than not waiting on God is wishing you had later on. They hurry ahead of God, but that's not God's promise. He is still waiting on a son. And his waiting on a son is counted as righteousness. Now get this, I, I worked on this a long time, so you're going to have to shout because I worked on this. I am the dumbest person in civilization when it comes to mathematics. I never could pass mathematics. Matter of fact, I had a high school friend, still a friend of mine today, uh, Kathy Baptiste. Kathy's father was a math teacher, and every time I wanted to pass a math exam, I'd sit behind Kathy because Kathy was always smarter than myself in math. Her father was a math teacher in high school, so she had all of the teacher's manuals, so she would slip them to me, so I would just put the answer on the page, because I've never been smart in mathematics. Never, never, not one time, never. 
But I do know something about minuens and subtrahens. In subtraction, there's what's called a minuend and a subtrahend. I, I worked on this a long time. I told you I'm dumb when it comes to math. So I had to really work on this, and I shouted myself when I, when I figured it out. There's a minuend and a subtrahend. The minuend and substra, subtrahend, when you subtract the subtrahend from the minuend, that equals the difference. Eight minus three equals five. Eight is the minuend, three is the subtrahend equals the difference five. That's how it works in mathematics. A minuend minus a subtrahend equals a difference. Eight minus three equals five. Minuend minus subtrahend gives you the difference. That's how it works in Ptolemaic mathematics. But in God's mathematics, minuend minus subtrahend equals dividend. Now, a dividend is an addition of something you have invested. And when you take something from something, it's minus something. But with God, if you take something from God, you add something. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. Minuhin, minuhin minus subtrahin supposed to be a difference. But if you trust God, the minuhin is God, subtrahin is you, the blessing is your dividend. And you walk away from God with more than you asked for and he still got more left. Because your taking from God does not mean God don't have enough for me. Somebody ought to help me preach here. Brothers and sisters, hear me. What was the message that Abram believed that God counted it as righteousness. What was the message? What did Abram believe that God counted it as righteousness? Abraham believed that God was sending a son. And when he believed in the son that God was sending, God counted it as righteousness. Abram believed in a son that God was sending. And God counted it as righteousness. I'm going to say it till you get it. Abram was looking for a son. And God counted it as righteousness. Abraham put his faith in a son and God counted it as righteousness. I'm going to say it one more time. Somebody about to get it. Abraham put his faith in a son and God counted it as righteousness. One Wednesday down in Eunice, Louisiana I put my faith in a son and God counted it as righteousness. Somebody else here this morning, put your confidence in a son and God made you righteous. You ain't no good, but God counted you as righteous. You're not worthy, but God counted you as righteous. You don't deserve it, but God counted you as righteous. Now the son Abraham was waiting on was Isaac. 
But Isaac not the son I was waiting on. Isaac is a promise to Abraham. But I got another promise. I wish I had somebody to help me here. My promise is the stem of Jesse. My promise is the root of David. My promise is without form nor comeliness. And when there's in him, when he comes, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I wish I had one or two witnesses here who's waiting on a son. And I look like I believe somebody here beside myself has found out who this son is. He's the son of righteousness. He's the desire of all nations. He's the day spring of Israel. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a time of storm. He's a friend when you're friendless. He's bread when you're hungry. He's water when you're thirsty. He's a shield and a great reward. Y'all know him, don't you? He's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Noah's ark. He's Moses' bush on fire. He's Joshua's battle axe. He's Gideon's fleece. He's Samson's power. He's David's music. I feel like it this morning. He's Solomon's wisdom. He's Jeremiah's balm. He's Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of a wheel. Y'all know him, don't you? He's God's only son. He's Mary's baby boy. He's James and Jude's older brother. He's Matthew's king. He's Mark's suffering servant. He's Luke's great physician. He's John's word made flesh. He's Acts coming of the Holy Ghost. He's the only begotten of the Father. Y'all know him, don't you? He's distinctive in supernatural capacity. Superlative in sovereign majesty. Exclusive in spiritual beauty. Radiant in eternal splendor. Matchless in supernal deity. He's the lily of the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. He's a bright and the morning star. He was born in Bethlehem. Reared in Nazareth. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. Y'all know him, don't you? One Friday on a hill called Calvary. He died. Didn't he die? They laid his body in a borrowed grave. He stayed there all night Friday. He stayed there all day Saturday. But bright early Sunday morning, he arose. Didn't he rise? And I'm here this morning in Lily Grove's pulpit because I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me. Is there anybody here who knows who I'm talking about? Help me call that name. Jesus, early in the morning, 
Jesus late in the evening Jesus in the midnight hour there's power in that name there's joy in that name there's hope in that name he's a mother for you he's a father for you he's a doctor for you why don't you grab somebody why don't you hug somebody tell them you don't know like I know what the Lord what the Lord I know he's alright I was coming back yesterday from preaching in Mansfield, Louisiana. Fitzgerald was driving me and we turned on the radio to the praise station in Sirius FM. And I heard a song on the radio. I don't know where they got it from, but they owe me some money. Because the man on the radio said to the choir, and the choir said to the people, I don't know where they got it from. I guess they heard it on YouTube somewhere. I guess they came to Lily Grove at some point. But the man singing on the radio said to the choir to say to the audience, I know he's all right. And the audience said, after the choir said it, I know he's all right. I don't know where they got it from. They owe me some money for that. But since they're saying it, I'm going to say it one more time. I know you are. Yeah! Yes! Yes! I know you are. with me he talks with me he tell me I'm his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known have you tried him won't he open doors won't he answer prayer won't he make a way tell him thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you. Why don't you hug somebody? Why don't you encourage somebody? Tell them whatever you're going through, whatever you are up against, God will take care of you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? I know he's all right. I've tried him. I've tried him when I didn't know how things were going to turn out. I don't even know if I believed he would fix it. But I heard my grandmother say, if you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. And here I am testifying that when faith is going up this side, the answer is coming up that side.
God will make a way out of no way. 